with our next interview, uh, we have uh, actually a long time friend and advocate here, Tony Anderson, who is now the uh, uh, the director of the uh, Valley Mountain Regional Center uh, here. And as we've been going through, uh, uh, as we're looking at different programs, uh, as as we've seen that the regional centers uh, and the are the center for services. Uh, for folks with uh, developmental disabilities in California. So I want to uh, welcome you, Tony, for joining us today and sharing uh, here a little insight about what is the Valley Mountain Regional Center and also what is the regional center system? Mm -hmm. Well, Valley, Valley, Valley Mountain Regional Center is one of, of 21 regional centers. And um, we were established in 1974 a lot of people don't know this because we were we were actually the region that included that was altus Alta california regional center uh is one of the larger ones in the state and covers 10 counties now but also used to cover the counties that we covered so that was broken off in 1974 to create the valley mountain regional center and we cover san joaquin stanislaus county uh, Calaveras, Almador County, and Tuolumne. So this is a big region. And at one point, that's how that was. It was part of that region. We now serve 18,000 uh, people with developmental disabilities. And then, of course, their families. So it's a, it, and it's a, the budget, the size of about um, $270 million. So uh, it's, the, and we're a middle sized regional center. So, if you look at, there's about seven that are ranked in the very high, uh, large regional centers that are over twenty, over twenty thousand that they serve, probably about twenty four and above, and then um, about seven around my size. We're one of the larger ones and one of the faster growing regional centers uh, because our our region is a, a pretty fast growing region, and um, but then the next seven on the bottom of that are significantly uh, less under 10,000 so they're um, they're the smaller regional centers so Tony for for folks that are are not familiar with what a regional center is which is something very unique to California can you give us an overall um, uh, uh, view of what is a regional center what is what is your mission and what is your function yes well, you know, when I talked about that big budget, that's not the budget that uh, that we use to run a regional center. That's the budget we use to spend money on the services for people with developmental disabilities. And each one of the regional centers has these large budgets. But that's what that money is for. So what we do in, in terms of the operations of what we do, we have social workers. Right? We call them service coordinators. And these service coordinators do these person-centered plans where they're really focusing on the individual, what's good for them, um, what's really important to them, those kinds of things. And then we sort of look at their goals in life and we try to help them meet that. And the whole purpose is to, to achieve uh, full participation in their community, right? So the old, old school before regional centers was institutionalization. People were removed and they were living in state hospitals at the time, and then they became developmental centers. This replaced that model. And now we pretty much have no developmental center, and we have all regional center services in the community. And their whole purpose is that we help people with disabilities, with developmental disabilities, have the life that anybody else would have. So access to all kinds of services that anybody else would have. And then some of our services are unique. The developmental disabilities so we'll have things respite services and uh, things that are specific to the needs of a person with a developmental disability and then sometimes we go working hard to make sure that they access the services that anybody else can get like school or in-home rest in-home support services or things that are available to other people and sometimes it's harder for our uh, the people we serve to get them so we help them get to those services as well. So that's what the service coordinators do. And we spend a lot of time supporting families. Well, what does it take to support a, a whole family unit together so that the person with a disability can can live with the family unit, can be part of the family and and, and participate fully 
uh, in the things that that family does. We do a million things, right? You could get me talking forever on what what we do, what we're, our purpose is, but the, the gist of it is that they can have the life that anybody else has and participate in their community. And, and as we're going to learn later, as we get into the actual IPP process uh, here with that segment of the program, the uh, the focus of the regional center is actually incredibly broad. Um, here, I don't know another program like it that is as holistic as it is. We need to uh, focus on structure and that sort of thing. So I know one thing, just as an advocate, I get a lot of families and persons with disabilities that feel that have this belief or seem to think that the uh, that regional centers are these monolithic things where people really can't get involved. Tony, can you tell me a little bit about the structure of the regional center, your board, and, you know, uh, the other part of that, is, is there an opportunity for a person with a disability or a family member to actually get involved uh, with the uh, oversight and policy of a regional center? Mm -hmm. In fact, the, the law is built in a way that uh, requires participation of the community. And our, our board of directors, there, there's volunteer board of directors, Ours is 21 members. Um, the different regional centers set their own amount. So, but ours is 21. And um, we all have to do, we have to meet these standards of, of uh, um, diversity. Uh, we've got to have cultural diversity. We're at the regional representation. We have to have um, some specialties that people have, some knowledge that people bring. We've got to look for that, like maybe legal, medical. So we're looking for all these different um, backgrounds, people from our communities, volunteers from our community. that may serve up to seven years, and that's a requirement in the law. They can't go beyond that. So most regional centers have three-year terms, so we'll do like a three and a three and a one. Um, but, the, but, but in the end, in the law, it says you can't go more than seven. And a lot of our activities are uh, open to the public, so there are laws in there. You've heard of open meeting laws for school districts or for state government. We're technically a nonprofit, but we do have open meeting laws as well, and that's written in the Lanham Act. So we have to have uh, we have to announce that you know we're having a board meeting. We have to put what's in is going to be there uh, on our websites, and we have to let the public know what's going on. And when we do a public hearing on any activity or any subject, we do the same thing. Uh, some of these uh, notices are 30 days, so people get proper notice of the things that are happening with the regional centers. But we constantly need public uh, comments. So we need their input on what we're doing to try to manage our, the caseload ratios at different times. Um, we have performance contracts that we do. we have to look at the amount of children living at home. All regional centers are are tasked with making sure that children live at home, and that's a high priority. And so they monitor that. We have to report out to the public on that. Adults living in smaller settings, so they're they're not getting anything close to institutionalizing people or large congregations. So they want to monitor that with the regional centers. These kinds of things, employment. Uh, cultural diversity, they're all part of our contracts with the state. And so we have to then tell the public how we're doing on these things and what we're going to do to do better on these things and get their feedback. And then that feedback gets collected and sent to the state. That we need the public uh, to come and to participate in what happens at the regional centers. We have a lot of those activities. And then boards, you know, we have a board. 21 people, it's done, right? But that's not it. We these Our boards have committees. And oftentimes, if you're interested in being on a board, you could serve on a committee first. And then you get a, a sense of what this committee does, what that board, how it relates to the board. Do you want to even do that? And so a lot of people do it that way, where they'll participate in subcommittees of the, of the, the regional center's board. And then activities. We're always doing some community events, and we need volunteers to help us with the uh, community events. We did vaccination clinics. We did we do flu clinics every year. We we did PPE, uh, you know, giveaways, and we we do all these things. Um, and we need volunteers. So 
there are many ways to participate and be part of the regional center system. Fantastic. So uh, a couple of other things just to go through here. Um, uh, one thing we're trying to focus on is diversity. So as far as like services that specifically you provide, but also um, other regional centers, um, do you have a special focus for folks that uh, uh, maybe are non-English speakers or with different cultural backgrounds or that sort of thing? How, how do you meet those needs? Um, that's a good question. We, we spent a lot of time um, studying what, you know, how people use our services. And um, more and more over the last five years, we've been doing a lot of different, um, we've done a lot of efforts to outreach to the different communities. Now, in our area, we have a large Hispanic community. Yeah, um, they're younger, so for us. And if you look at our population, all the adults over 25, the, the, um, the makeup, the ethnic makeup, the racial eth um, makeup, it's completely different than those that are younger. So you have to, we have to figure out what we're doing there for the older uh, populations to meet their needs and then the changing uh, needs of the younger generation uh, and their, the ethnic makeup there. We're about 44% Hispanic on our younger population. And if you look at our, our older, it's the uh, vast majority is uh, Caucasian. So, and then all of our other um, ethnicities that we serve, cultures that we serve are, are about reflective of what you would normally see uh, statewide. But, but that's how, that's how we're built. And so we have to reach out to the, a lot to the Hispanic community and figure out what is it uh, that we're doing there that will help, um, you know, interest them and that, that they'll understand what we're trying to do with these services, the purpose for them, um, the rules around them, because not all services, you don't just get all of our services automatically. There has to be some kind of identified need. So what is it that we're trying to address with that? What need of yours? And then what need do you have that we don't have a service for? So what would we create? And so we're allowed to do a lot of custom kind of things. We have a self-determination program that allows a lot of customization as well. And there are other ways that we can customize. So um, we are we do have some flexibility. Uh, we can't just make things up, though, but we do have some flexibility of, of meeting the needs of the family. So a lot, uh, that's a lot on your plate, man. So as far as the focus is concerned and, you know, uh, and, and we are in, in this series here, talking to the school programs and that kind of thing. But can you give us just kind of a brief overview of um, focus at different uh, age uh, levels uh, from birth to early childhood to uh, youth and teens, the transition uh, years to adulthood, um, and, and also something that uh, uh, we're dealing with more and more of uh, folks with disabilities living longer than they've ever lived before. Yes, thank God. But that, it's true. It does add more uh, complexities. But we, we, uh, you know, we have got an early start program, and that's zero to three technically. We actually start to reassess around two years, nine months. But this is for uh, children of them and maybe at risk. Maybe they they might have a, a long term developmental disability. Um, maybe there's some factors involved in their birth that. Uh, that are also maybe reflective of high risk. And so we want to get in there early. And so we have a very comprehensive program called the called Early Intervention. We call it Early Start. And we we have very tight timelines for our service coordinators on this one because it's a very short period of time in a child's life. So we're, we, we've got uh, maybe there's autism uh, sort of services might be involved or behavioral services. Uh, we want to, uh, maybe there's some OTPT. There's just this intensive approach on uh, working with these young kids and their families uh, early on, get them, get them right out the gate. And then not all of them then uh, need lifelong services. So in many cases, we are successful with the family and then they don't need to continue on with our services. So uh, that's a good thing. 
And uh, and sometimes people feel like it's a bad thing because they're like, well, but they receive so much support and help. But it's really if you've met your milestones now, you've reached, you've you've stepped up your your abilities as a little child, and the family now has new tools, and then they can move on to their next journey. And then of course we give them referrals to the next things that they'll need. But uh, we start to look at them again and reassess around two years, nine months. So. Right around the end there, just before they're turning three, we look and see, have we made, have we been able to make a difference? Are they progressing? And in sometimes we find that, in, in fact, they do have a lifelong developmental disability. And so uh, those are the Lanterman Act services is usually what you'll hear. And that is, that's your core regional center services. The Lanterman Act is there for uh, anybody who's Got a developmental disability. It's a disability that occurs during their developing years, um, um, eighteen under, uh, and then uh, and then they have the services though their whole life. So those are the Lanterman Act services, like things like uh, intellectual disabilities, autism. People think of uh, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy. One of our core. Uh, there is epilepsy as well. And then something else that we call fifth category that just is similar to the needs of, uh, of a of regularly eligible uh, consumer. So somebody with a developmental disability. Okay, so a couple other things here before we close the segment out. Um, you know, we've gone through your website. You have a very robust website, as most of the regional centers do. That's probably a very good place to get started uh, when you're learning about the services with your regional center. Uh, here. Can you tell me about, you know, your outreach? Do you have newsletters? Do you have uh, directories of services? Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we really work hard on um, on communicating through our, our websites and our social media as well. And all regional centers do that. It's our, it's our primary way of doing it, of getting all this information. And some of it is mandatory. So regional centers have a section on there where it's a, it's a, what we call it, transparency. There's like a transparency page or disclosures page. And so, um, there are things that are required by law and all regional centers manage all these reports right there for the public. Um, but we have a, we have a, one of our biggest thing that we've done, we started doing it during the pandemic, but it, it's, it's a weekly newsletter. And so anything that's going on you know, during the pandemic, there's been so much change, rapid change. Every week there's new things, new directives. So to keep up with that, we just thought we would start writing the report every week and you know, letting the community know what's happening. And um, now it's evolved to just information that you want to know, uh, things happening in your community, um, special programs for people with developmental disabilities, highlights of achievements of people with disabilities and and children, um, their perspectives. And so we really, uh, it's a great uh, publication. Again, like up to 50% open rate, which is unheard of. Right? So the, we're, uh, we have a really nice, robust uh, communication there. It's a newsletter. I learned that from other regional centers who were doing newsletters as well so there are others that do that and that's that's one of our biggest things of course all throughout our our website we, we uh, you can change the language so that it reads in the language that you you read the best you're more comfortable with and so and then you can navigate through there any of these public forums that i talked about before where we need public comment and uh, and we need you to hear about it, learn about what we're doing. Those are all on there. We're constantly um, publishing those. And then uh, we have social media as well where for people, some people prefer to do their communication there. So we have Facebook and Instagram, LinkedIn. And um, we use LinkedIn for all of our job related and employment related activities. So I mentioned that we're with the Chamber of Commerce. Any of those uh, new businesses that are opening, we highlight them there. And then we also tell the new business, hey, did you know a person with a developmental disability could be an excellent employee for your new business? And then that's always part of our, our uh, intro. 
and then we say hello and tell them our name. Right. <laughs> so, so we have all kinds of communications and a lot of outreach too. About two, three events a month. Well, fantastic. And and once again, we'd encourage folks to go to not only if you're in the Valley Mountain Regional Center catchment area to look at uh, the the uh, uh, website there, but also once again, there are other you know, to also get familiar with your local regional center and all that. Tony, I wanted to end on on one last thing and we could go on and on and on, but you know, um, a really key component to make this work are your service coordinators. Just one, can you tell us, and this is gonna be the hard part, briefly, <laughs> the, you know, what the service coordinator does. But the other thing is, um, um, why would someone want to become a service uh, coordinator? What what kind of person would thrive in that kind of position? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, it, with the bulk of our employees are service coordinators. I was a service coordinator myself, and um, it is an incredible job. You get to meet so many different people. The, the really neat thing about it is that when you – you get to meet people, adults with developmental disabilities, or these families who are working so hard and and they just have so much love for their child. You just can't help but like get consumed in what's happening, what they're trying to do, and then you, you realize that we've got some tools here to help some of these families who feel stuck. And uh, it's extremely rewarding when you can uh, work with a family and and then provide some services or even sometimes just provide them the information and access to a service that they didn't know about. And it just makes a huge difference for the family. But when you're in the middle of it all, you, you just, it's hard to see that these services that would be so helpful for you are right there. They're so close to you that you can't see them. And the service coordinators see that all the time. They're familiar with all the services, their communities, and then they know how to help you get there. And it's very rewarding for uh, for anybody, so for our service coordinators to really help them get, get past them. And then the other thing I hear often uh, from service coordinators is just how um, excited they are when they see some, somebody who they had a, on their caseload when they were younger, and then how they um, moved on and grew and the things that they were able to achieve. and. Sometimes people can't see long term and they see a child maybe who has a lot of behavioral problems and can't communicate well or, or at all. And they think, well, how will they ever uh, evolve? And then they see them as their checker at their grocery store uh, performing their job perfectly and telling them to have a nice day and remembering them as well. And um, it's just it just sort of you know, gives you this faith in the human spirit that, that people, all people can do so many things and you just have to have a team sometimes to help you along. And um, there's a great sense of satisfaction with that. And uh, working with families and creating goals, uh, we're going to we're gonna try to meet this goal and then here's the plan to meet that goal. And we're going to put these services and these supports in place and we think that that's going to help us get closer to the goal. And eventually you do, you get there and you start moving and you start achieving and you're achieving the things that this child wants to achieve or that the family needs so that they got all stay together longer in, in a healthy way. So um, it's, a, it's an incredible job. I mean, it's very hard. Their caseloads are extremely high. Um, so it's frustrating because you can't spend enough of uh, quality time and in-depth quality time. Uh, there's a lot of paperwork involved, but all of that has an end that is is uh, something that very few people get to have in their jobs, and that is to see this uh, this ama amazing growth and accomplishment. And the accomplishments well, could be very right. Very well, my expectation and is, and I know just as a former. Um, um, uh, provider of services myself is whether you're a short timer or a long timer, you're going to learn skills that are going to be with you for the rest of your life. And um, so once again, I, I, I think this is a good place to end is that 
Um, I know the, the wonderful programs that the regional centers do and all that, but you know, in the end, it's the service coordinator that carries these things through. So. Oh yeah, yeah. I'd say this whole system, you know, it it it's on the backs of the service coordinators and the service providers. That's where the touching. That's the touch point that touches people with disabilities and their families and all the rest, all the great work that you do and that I do is irrelevant if those people are not able to do the work that they need to do. And they're the real heroes in our whole system, our service coordinators in our, in our service providers. Okay. So anyway, just ending this today that, you know, regional centers basically for folks with IDD, uh, here it is the center uh, piece for a lot of services. It's one of those things where you can and should get involved, whether you're a professional, a family member, a person with a disability. Uh, here it's an ever evolving process. And, and Tony, uh, whereas uh, maybe you can confirm this, whereas all regional centers have certain core things they do, everyone is different according to the region and according to the need. Is that correct? Yep, that is correct. We are supposed to be responsive to the local community need. So made up of a local board and we have certain local policies and priorities, all still within the huge umbrella of the land. So. Fantastic. So Tony, I want to thank you for joining us today and sharing your knowledge. And I know we probably could have got on for another hour here, but thank you for everything you do and thank you for, for your staff. Uh, here and also for folks that are watching this, uh, you know, part of the objective here is not just uh, focusing on how to get services, but also how can you integrate um, with your community. So regional centers are a very good place to begin.